Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is June 23rd, 2021, and I am very grateful uh, to have you here with me today for kind of a, a special Mormon Stories Podcast episode. And by special, I mean kind of different. I'm doing something today that I um, have never done before, and I don't know if I'll, I'll ever do it again. Um, and I'll just give you a little bit of background. Uh, so, you know, early on in the history of Mormon Stories podcast, uh, I prided myself on trying to be as balanced as possible, on trying to uh, interview people who are faithful, people who weren't faithful, interview regular members of the church, ex-Mormons, apologists, faithful people, uh, you know, people all across the spectrum, including, you know, scholars and historians. And I was able to do that for um, several years. And that included interviewing, you know, um, members of Fair Mormon, like Scott Lynch or John Lynch, uh, Daniel Peterson. It included faithful, interviewing faithful scholars like Richard Bushman um, and Terrell and Fiona Givens and others, uh, even Patrick Mason and uh, Thomas McConkie, et cetera. And, uh, and of course, I would also interview people like Grant Palmer and people who had left the church and Brett Metcalf and Michael Quinn and others. So for many, many years, I worked really hard to make Mormon Stories podcasts really balanced, had people from all over the spectrum. Um, once I started feeling the obligation to be really open and honest about my problems with the church, and once, frankly, I started seeing the real damage that the church was causing to marriages, to people's individual mental health, to marriages, to families, LGBT people, racism, sexism, all that stuff. Once I saw that they continued to silence uh, historians and truth tellers, uh, once I started really as a, as a mental health professional getting in, immersing myself in the collateral damage that was caused by the church, uh, I felt an obligation to speak out against those problems. And, and also, once I started to really believe that informed consent was a really important thing and that the, that the church was not uh, observing even the most basic rules or guidelines regarding informed consent, being open and honest about its history, and that that, that lack of informed consent was causing so much damage. I, I felt like I had an obligation to speak out and to speak directly. And as soon as I did, people like Terrell and Fiona Givens, Richard Bushman, and others uh, started refusing to come on Mormon Stories podcast. And in fact, this was, of course, uh, exacerbated by my excommunication. And I believe that the Mormon Church intentionally excommunicated me uh, so that uh, my podcast would no longer be experienced as something that was safe uh, to be a part of by, you know, BYU professors, by uh, Mormon scholars that wanted to remain in the good graces of the church uh, and who wanted access to the church's archives. So all of that, I think, was intentional and calculated on the church. But it, but it has been very painful for me that over the past six to ten years, um, uh, let's say six to 14 years, um, let's see, yeah, 14 years, many people that used to come on Mormon Stories won't come on Mormon Stories podcast anymore. And that includes Richard Bushman. So many of you know that I interviewed Richard Bushman in 2007. And uh, it, for me, it was one of the most, still to this day, it remains one of the most important interviews uh, I've ever done. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, but since that time, Richard Bushman has refused to come back on Mormon Stories, which is totally his prerogative. And even though I interviewed Terrell and Fiona Givens a couple times, there there came a point when I started being more direct and critical of the church that Terrell and Fiona and others have refused to come on Mormon Stories podcast. And that's been really sad for me. It's been very hard. Uh, it's their right, but it's been hard. And so um, I have been stewing about uh, my sadness around this for many, many, many years. And you've probably seen it, those of you who follow Mormon Stories podcast, you've probably seen it come out in the way that I've talked about 
the Givenses and Patrick Fluman and um, Patrick Mason and Richard Bushman and Claudia, uh, sorry, and Fiona Givens and others, I have been frustrated um, at their unwillingness to take hard questions, to come on um, alternative forums and to face the heat and to speak truth and to have integrity, to not just sort of speak in these private firesides um, and only say the more critical things in these private firesides where they're not saying things publicly. Um, and, and again, their unwillingness to come on podcasts like this. So what I decided to do, you know, it was Richard Bushman's birthday this week. And um, it, it brought back to me a lot of these feelings I've been having, the sadness that I've been having for a long time about Bushman being unwilling to come on Mormon Stories podcast. It also reminded me that there was this very, very important statement that Richard Bushman made in 2016 about the dominant uh, historical narrative that the church has been teaching for generations being not true or false. And uh, me feeling a sense of frustration that, that even though that statement of Richard Bushman's has now been out for five years, most uh, Mormons don't even know about it. I was shocked to find out Kara Burrell, this person that I, um, this, this uh, TikToker and um, talented uh, young Mormon woman who's been helping me with TikTok and social media, she had never heard of this statement just as of a few days ago, this really important statement that Richard Bushman made at a fireside in 2016, it was in a private home and a private fire said he makes this earth shattering statement and nobody knows about it. So those two facts this week inspired me to do kind of a, a one off kind of special episode on Mormon stories podcast. And I'm calling it questions I would ask Richard Bushman. And what this represents is if I could ask Richard Bushman certain questions, if he would agree to come on Mormon Stories podcast like he used to, what questions would I ask him? And I didn't just stop there. There's commentary that I prepared in this episode. And um, I also incorporated many questions from you. I've got questions from, from uh, Bill Real, from Alan Mount, from I think I think maybe even something from RFM and many of you listeners, I've aggregated your questions and all of us know that questions aren't just questions. There's often a lot of wisdom and truth in questions. And so, um, with, with all of that, um, I'm going to just spend the next hour or so, um, alone sharing with you some questions and thoughts and feelings. And I wanted to begin by, um, by offering just a few disclaimers. And uh, these disclaimers are really important to me and I'm listing them here so that you can read them. Uh, but, but, but I do want to offer a few disclaimers and, and here they are. Um, first and foremost, I wanna make sure everyone understands that I have deep respect for Richard Bushman, his talents and his record as a historian. He's a legend by all accounts. I also acknowledge that with Rough Stone Rolling, Richard Bushman has done more to advance uh, honest history within the LDS Church than, than almost anyone else on the planet, except for, you know, Jeremy Runnels uh, or, you know, certain podcasters or, you know, other historians like Michael Quinn or Dan Vogel or Grant Palmer. You know, Richard Bushman is up there with his, his contributions to Rough Stone Rolling and the Joe Smith Papers Project. Having said that, I do think more people have learned truthful history through Fawn Brody, Jeremy Runnels, Mormon Stories podcast, Grant Palmer. I do think more people have been influenced by them than by Richard Bushman, but he's certainly up there. Um, and I want to give him credit for that. He has been an important part in the past uh, 10 or 15 years at helping Mormons and the rest of the world become more knowledgeable about truthful Mormon history. And I want to give him credit for that. I fully acknowledge that Richard Bushman is deeply loved uh, by, by Orthodox believing Mormons, by the Mormon studies uh, crowd, by um, Mormon historians, uh, and by ex-Mormons and post-Mormons. And I feel affection for him as well. So I don't mean disrespect by this episode, even though I think some people are going to accuse me of, of being disrespectful. I, I mean no disrespect from this episode. I respect him greatly. And so I'm saying that up front. 
Um, one thing that I want to really be clear, I, I, I think I, you know, some people misinterpreted statements that I made on Facebook in the past or elsewhere that, um, that it's my position that Richard Bushman, you know, is not a, a believer in the Mormon church or that I tried to misinterpret his statements from the Faith Again Fireside as meaning that Richard Bushman uh, doesn't believe that the church is true. Uh, Richard Bushman to this day has made numerous public utterances that he believes in golden plates, literally. He believes in angels, literally, and he believes that the Mormon church is true. He believes in the fundamental um, truth claims of the Mormon church. As far as I know, that's still true to this day. And so please don't take this episode as me indicating otherwise, um, because th that's not my understanding. Um, I am going to stipulate that I'm saddened by the fact that Richard Bushman has refused to uh, come back on a Mormon Stories podcast when he's been willing to go on so many other podcasts. He's been quite prolific in, in appearing on podcasts. So it's not a matter of time. It's not a matter of interest. I think it's literally that um, you know, that he doesn't feel comfortable taking the hardest questions, the most direct questions. Um, I also, I also believe, um, that, that he is trying to do something which I can't really fault him for. He's trying to manage his political capital. He wants access to the church archives. He wants access to the brethren. He wants, um, to remain in good graces with the, you know, powerful leaders of the Mormon church. And he wants to stay a credible voice for believing church membership. And so in all those, for all those reasons, he feels like he needs to manage his political capital. So he can't come on a Mormon stories podcast. I get it. I don't fault him for that, but it does make me sad. And to me, it does, it does take down a notch, my respect for him, just to be frank, uh, because for me, the person that deserves the most respect and the most credibility is someone who can take the heat from all sides of the aisle and speak with integrity to all uh, audiences, regardless of who or where they are. And frankly, there's so much at stake. There's so many people that have been harmed by the, the lack of honesty and openness by the Mormon church and its policies for marginalized communities. There's so many people that have been hurt and there's so much at stake and the church is on record, um, deceiving people that I think, uh, the people who I hold the most respect for um, are willing to speak truth to power publicly, candidly, and openly. And frankly, as much respect as I have for Richard Bushman, he and Terrell and Fiona Givens and you know many other Mormon scholars have have fallen short. I don't think they care uh, that 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 um, you know they don't hold I, that I don't hold them in the highest esteem. I still hold them with a lot of esteem but not in the highest esteem. And I don't think they care, but I just wanted to say that I'm sure that those feelings influence or bias uh, my, my feedback on what I have to say today. Um, uh, of course, uh, you know, I wish a couple more disclaimers. Of course, I wish that Richard Bushman were here to answer these questions himself. And in that sense, it's not fair or it's uh, unfortunate. Um, I just will, I'll, I'll end this disclaimers by saying my intent is not to malign or slam Richard. These are literally the questions I would ask him if he were here. And finally, I do believe that this episode will be helpful to people, even though Richard's not here to answer the questions. So, um, now let's jump into the meat. Uh, thanks so much to everyone for, um, being willing to, uh, to be a part of this episode. Um, I want to begin by playing again this Faith Again to Fireside clip that was recorded in Salt Lake City, Utah on June 12th, uh, 2016. And this is this is so important to me for one major reason. Um, you know, I, I'm playing it here because most people have never heard it. Most people don't know about it. And I believe that this little clip, this little clip from a two hour fireside that Richard and Claudia Bushman gave in the basement of someone's Salt Lake City home, to me is one of the most important moments in Mormon church history. Uh, and people say that that's ridiculous or absurd or hyperbole. To me, it's not. To me, R Richard Bushman is the highest ranking historian, faithful historian, probably in the history of the Mormon church. He's been educated at Harvard. He's taught at Columbia. 
He's published a, a, a kind of an authorized biography of Joseph Smith. He, you know, he was embraced by the Maxwell Institute, by the Joseph Smith Papers Project. There is no more well-respected historian, Mormon historian in the history of the Mormon church than Richard Bushman, not B.H. Roberts, who wasn't a trained historian, you know, Leonard Arrington, who was dismissed, uh, you know, unceremoniously without even, you know, an acknowledgement in general conference from his 10 years as church historian, not Marlon Jensen. Nobody holds the status of Richard Bushman. So what he said in this fireside, in this basement on June 12th, 2016, for me in Salt Lake City, is one of the most important events in Mormon church history because he acknowledges, in my view, that Mormon church leadership have been deceiving uh, the, the church membership for decades, misleading them by teaching a intentionally teaching a false narrative. And I'm going to be making that claim very explicitly because people think or claim, especially apologists claim that I misrepresent what Bushman said here. So I'm going to pick it apart piece by piece. And I'm going to give sort of like a SmackDown RFM like analysis of, of this statement. And then I'm going to follow up with questions that I would ask Richard Bushman himself. But without any further ado, I'm going to play this recording. And I'm going to just stipulate or acknowledge that the audio quality of this, um, this statement is not good. But I do have subtitles, and you'll be able to read those. And even if it's muffled, just give us a couple minutes, and I'm going to come back and read to you parts of the statement and then address them. But I want to make sure that uh, this statement that this uh, this statement is provided on a Mormon Stories podcast episode, and to date it isn't. So here it is for all of you, Richard Bushman's uh, excerpt, the excerpt from the Faith Again Fireside in Salt Lake City, Utah, June 12th, 2016, with subtitles. Um, it'll be question, answer, question, answer. And um, again, you can check out the visuals uh, to read what's being said. So I'll now play, I'll now roll the tape. Yes, sir. I wondered, um, so it's, to me, a lot of the incongruity that, that, that exists now, that is giving rise to a lot of participation in that situation, seems to be caused, um, in, in my, my view, by by the disparity between the dominant narrative, the dominant, what I would call the orthodox narrative, which is what we learn as missionaries, what we teach, you know, investigators, what we learn in Sunday school. And then as you get older, you kind of start to experience Mormonism in, in different ways. And those ways become um, very important to you and dear to you, but sometimes they may not, they may not jive with some elements of the orthodox narrative. And so what I'm wondering is, like, in your view, do you see room within Mormonism for several different narratives, multiple narratives of a religious experience? Or do you think that in order for the church to remain strong, they would have to hold to that dominant narrative? I think for the church to remain strong, it has to reconstruct its narrative. The dominant narrative is not true. It can't be sustained. So the church has to absorb all this new information or it'll be on very shaky grounds. And that's what it's, it's trying to do. And it'll be a strain for a lot of people, uh, older people especially. But I think, I think it has to change. Uh, you know, Elder Packer had this sense of protecting the little people. He, he felt that the scholars were the enemy to this faith. And it was the grandmothers living in San Pete County. <laughs> uh, and that was, that was a very lovely pastoral image. But the price of protecting the grandmothers was the loss of the grandsons. They, they got a story that, that didn't work. So we just had to change our... It seems to me because the, the, like, like what you're saying, I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I just wonder, you know, what, we, we have such a strong tradition of, of, of emphasizing the dominant orthodox narrative. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how, how does the church do that without, like you say, like, like pushing some people away while also introducing, yeah. you know, the idea that it's okay to yeah. experience Mormonism in different ways? Yeah. 
Yeah, the question is, uh, will we leave room to experience Mormonism in different ways? Or is our strength the fact that we all hold on to the same tree? I actually am concerned about that, and I think people who have a more progressive view or who are up to date on what's going on, they know that the mature version have to be very sympathetic to people who are having trouble letting go. Mm -hmm. we gotta, there, there just has to be many ways to grow the church. We want them to be sympathetic of us as we struggle along. And there has to be a brotherly and sisterly act. We don't want to break up our community, which is our, our great strength in the beauty of the church in the name of finding some abstract truth that works better for each one of us. Um, so it's going to be a struggle for the next um, two or three decades anyway as we go through this, this process. All right, so that is the statement. I apologize um, that it's a little bit hard to hear. And um, I'm going to just reread it now, um, the, the transcriptions of the two uh, statements that Bushman made without the questions so that um you know they're just really clear so that people can hear what richard bushman said he wrote quote i think for the church to remain strong it has to reconstruct its narrative the dominant narrative is not true and that is the main statement that uh, i think is probably the most important sentence uttered in the 20th or 21st century in mormonism the dominant narrative is not true. That's what Richard Bushman said. It can't be sustained. This is Richard Bushman again. So the church has to absorb all this new information or it will be on very shaky grounds. And that's what it's trying to do. And it'll be a strain for a lot of people, old people especially. But I think it has to change. Elder Packer had this sense of protecting the little people. He felt like the scholars were an enemy to this faith. And it was the grandmothers living in San Pete County. And that was a very lovely pastoral image. But the price of protecting the grandmothers was the loss of the grandsons. They got a story that didn't work. So we've just had to change our narrative. That is uh, the statement by that. That is the first half of the statement from Richard Bushman. Now I'll go on to the second part. He wrote, yeah, the question is, will we leave room to experience Mormonism in different ways? Or is our strength the fact that we can all hold on to the same tree, all hugging in the same spot? I actually am concerned about that. And I think people who have a more progressive view or who are up to date on what's going on, they know, quote, a truer version, quote, have to be very sympathetic for people who are having trouble letting go. There just has to be many ways to grow the church. We want them to be sympathetic of us as we struggle on. It has to be a brotherly and sisterly act. We don't want to break up our community, which is our great strength and the beauty of the church in the name of finding some abstract, abstract truth that works better for each one of us. So it's going to be its struggle for the next, I don't know, two or three decades as we go through this process. Okay, so those are, those, th those are the statements that I'm basing most of this episode on, and I'm going to just do a bit of a, uh, hopefully a respectful bit of a smackdown or analysis of some of these statements because they're really important. I do think it's important to note, again, something I've already called attention to, which is, as far as I know, these are statements that Richard Bushman has never really made outside of really these private settings. And this is something that's bothered me for a long, long time. Terrell and Fiona Givens do this. Um, you know, Spencer Fluman does this, uh, Richard Bushman does this, and many apologists do this, where there's what they'll say publicly, you know, on radio shows or on podcasts or to news reporters or whatever. 
And then there's what they'll say when someone comes after a fireside to ask him a question or in these secret little one-on-one -on -one meetings like Spencer Fluman will have with, with people in his office, which I've covered on Mormon Stories, or what Richard Bushman or Terrell or Fiona Givens will say privately in a little private clustered forum or, um, you know, what, what they'll say one-on-one. -on -one. And it's often very, very different. Now, I understand that politically they have to manage their capital. But my my understanding of the word integrity is that that how you talk to people is the same no matter where you are, no matter what room you enter in, no matter who you're speaking to. And I'm going to acknowledge that um, I'm not perfect in that regard. And I'm going to I'm going to say that that I I I fail in this regard. But that's, you know, that's integrity to me. And I've tried to live with integrity, um, and I'm sure they do too. But I don't have integrity when, let's just say, you know, Tara, Terrell Givens will tell people in private that he thinks the brethren are, you know, um, not that smart or not that educated, uh, or um, that the brethren are kind of bumbling idiots. You know, whatever phrases he'll use about the quorum of the 12 and the first presidency privately, and then he won't say that publicly, there's something wrong about that. And if Bushman is going to say that the brethren have been teaching a false narrative, and I would argue he's saying that they've intentionally been teaching a false or an untrue narrative publicly for generations, but he won't say that in any of his public statements, I think that's problematic. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm just going to say that up front. The fact that Bushman will say this in a basement, in a private setting, but he won't go on the record is a problem given the harm the church has caused. And then the fact that when he was really called out on this, it almost seemed like he backtracked and waffled um, and, and didn't own up to the statement and then provide clarification. And if I'm wrong, please correct me, but that was problematic to me at the time. So now I am going to start sharing. I'm going to be breaking down his statement and asking some of the questions I would be asking Richard Bushman if he would um, have the integrity uh, or the courage um, to come on Mormon Stories podcast. Um, so in response to an excerpt from his quote where he said, I think the church, I think for the church to remain strong, it has to reconstruct its narrative. So that's a statement that Richard Bush, Richard Bushman made. I would ask Richard Bushman, is the goal, um, is the most important goal that the church remains strong? Because that's how he frames it in this episode. You never hear him say, you know, I think for the church to do what is right. I think for the church to do what is honest. I think for the church to have integrity, you know, he doesn't frame it that way. He frames it as, I think for the church to remain strong, it has to reconstruct its narrative. And, and, and that's the way I. Th it seems like he thinks. It seems like Richard Bushman puts a primacy on the church remaining strong and vital, the church community remaining strong and vital. But my question to him is, is the historical lack of informed consent amongst the Mormon people a concern to you, Richard Bushman? Or is it just the strength of the Mormon church? Is that your main concern? In other words, is it a problem to you that for generations and generations, people have given their reputation, their time, their money, their lives to the church under a false narrative? Is that a problem for you at all? Is it, is it a serious moral failing on the part of the church and its leadership? Or is it just some unfortunate thing that now is jeopardizing the strength um, and the vitality of the church, and thus the church needs to come up with a new narrative? That's the first question I would ask you, Richard Bushman. And to me, it is one of the most important uh, questions, and it's one of the most important driving uh, functions for Mormon Stories podcast and why I do what I do. Okay, next question. Um, when Bushman, when Richard Bushman acknowledges that the dominant narrative is not true, uh, I go on to sort of state just very explicitly, and this follows from the point I just made, does the Mormon church have an ethical obligation to admit 
that it provided its members an untrue narrative, in your words, an untrue narrative. In other words, it misled its members. We'll, we'll put aside the question of whether it intentionally misled its members or unintentionally misled its members. I'll address that in just a second. But let's just say that they unintentionally misled its members. For over a century, does the Mormon church and its leadership have an obligation to apologize for that and to repent and to make restitution for that? Or in your view, Richard Bushman, does, does the Mormon church, the one true church, or the, you know, the Quorum of the Twelve and the First Presidency, do they get a pass on basic ethics, on the doctrine of repentance, and on the, on the concept of reconciliation? Do they just get a pass? I would ask you to answer that question, Richard Bushman. Why have you never come uh, out in the open to address what I think are the moral failings of the Mormon Church and its leadership? by teaching us an untrue narrative, by teaching investigators, by teaching the world, by perpetuating an untrue narrative for generations and generations. My next question for you, Richard Bushman, have you ever admitted this fact publicly that the church taught an untrue narrative? Was it only in private secret settings where you have admitted this fact, one-on-one, -on -one, in basements, with a closed audience. Is this the only time you've admitted that the church taught an untrue narrative for generations? Or have you admitted this openly and publicly in other areas? I could be wrong. Maybe I've missed it. But I, if you haven't, I'm wondering why. Why have you not admitted this more openly, um, more publicly? Is it because you want to remain in the church's good graces? Is it because you're afraid of what they'll do to you? Is it because of conflicts of interest? Um, and would it show integrity for you to be more open and honest and admit this in public versus just in private settings? And do you have kind of a moral or an ethical obligation um, to be more open and honest um, about this? Just a thought, uh, I'm, I'm curious. That's a question that, that I would ask you. Um, next question. Um, again, on this issue of the dominant narrative uh, not being true, on your acknowledgement, this is a question that I would ask you, Richard Bushman. Um, given that, given that, um, you know, it appears your position as the Mormon church leaders did not intentionally mislead its membership. So when, when you responded to the, um, you know, the making public of your statement that the Mormon church taught an untrue narrative. And people, including myself, sort of maybe unintentionally gave the impression that you were saying that the church knowingly misled its, its members. And I think you've gone on record as saying that the church did not knowingly mislead its members or knowingly deceive its members. Here's my question to you, Richard Bushman. Um, given that, uh, you know, let's just go kind of do a walk down memory, mem memory lane a little bit. Um, given that, you know, the Mormon church, g given that the New York times published, um, an acknowledgement of sort of, uh, the book of Abraham papyrus, not being translated correctly by Joseph Smith in 1912 given the church that the you know given the fact that the church knew that joseph smith's papyra you know were a mistranslation of the the um, egyptian on the papyrus the church has known that since 1912 given the fact that now we know through shannon caldwell montez's research that the entire first presidency in the quorum of the 12 and all the general authorities were put on notice by bh roberts in 1922 that the book of mormon had serious credibility problems historically um, linguistically uh, geographically archaeologically and that bh roberts informed them of, them of this as 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 early as 1922 and then they send him you know on a mission and, and try to emace, erase as much as possible B.H. Roberts from the memory of, of the church. Given the fact that Fawn Brody's book, No Man Knows My History, you know, was received by the church with, with denunciations of it being a smear job 
with with Fawn Brody herself being excommunicated from the church, given the fact that that Mormon church historian and eventual prophet and apostle Joseph Fielding Smith hid um, the 1832 account. He cut out the 1832 account uh, of Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith's first vision, the earliest version that we have of Joseph Smith's first vision account. The fact that Joseph Fielding Smith cut this out of Joseph Smith's diary and hid it for decades until the Tanners called him out on it. And then he secretly put it back in with no explanation. Given the fact that Leonard Arrington's um, administration of opening up the archives to church history was canceled and mothballed, and, and Leonard Arrington was dismissed and released unceremoniously without any you know, general conference acknowledgement of his, his work as church historian. Given the fact that dialogue has existed since the 60s, that Sunstone has existed since the 70s, that you, the Mormon church, uh, denounced forums like Dialogue and Sunstone intentionally to make um, church employees afraid to participate in them. Given the fact that you excommunicated so many people on or around, uh, you know, September of 1993, you know, given the fact that Richard Bushman's first book, Joseph Smith and the Beginnings of Early Mormonism, was was sort of canceled by the church and he had to publish it elsewhere. Given the excommunication or disfellowship of Grant Palmer, here's my question to you, Richard Bushman. Isn't it pretty clear that the Mormon church leadership have known the true and accurate Mormon history for a century or more? They've known about the peep stones in the hat. They've known about the, the false translation of the book of Abraham. They've known about Joseph Smith's polygamy. They've known about all these problems. They've known about all these problems. And they have not, they have not only intentionally not taught the truthful history to the members for generations, they've silenced and punished the historians who have dared talk openly and punish uh, openly about the church history for decades. So, so isn't that then sort of an intentional misrepresentation or misleading or deceit on the part of the leadership um you know towards the membership doesn't that make this a conscious misleading of the of the church membership and of the world by by the lds church leadership i think it's a fair question to ask whether this false narrative that you richard bushman have acknowledged as false was intentionally perpetrated um, by by Mormon church leaders. And I actually have more um, more evidence for that or, or about that later. Okay, my next uh, my next question for you, uh, Richard Bushman, when you acknowledge that um, the dominant narrative is not is is not true, you went on to say, so the church has to absorb all this new information. So that those are your words, Richard Bushman. The church now, so he's saying this in 2016, so the church now has to absorb all this new information. And my question to you, Richard Bushman is, and I mean this respectfully, but I don't understand what you're saying. The church in 2013 or 14 or 15 or 16 has to absorb the new information. Is this information new, Richard Bushman, or again, did the church learn about this in 1912 when the New York Times came out with the Book of Abraham article? Or in 1922 when B.H. Roberts put them all on notice about the problems of the Book of Mormon and, frankly, with the view of the Hebrews, you know, connections? Or with Fawn Brody's book, No Man Knows My History? Or with the Leonard Arrington administration? Or with Dialogue? Or with Sunstone? Or with the September 6th? Or with Signature Books? Is this new information that the church um, has had to absorb, or has the church known this information all along? Richard Bushman, it seems like you're trying to tell people that prophets and apostles for generations have not known this troubling information. Joseph F. Smith surely did. Joseph Fielding Smith certainly did. B.H. Roberts certainly did. Bruce R. McConkie certainly did. Um, you know, Ezra Taft Benson certainly did. Boyd K. Packer certainly did. They knew they wanted to hide it from us. 
and Richard Bushman, I think you know this. I think you know this, and I think you are either afraid to talk openly about this for fear of punishment, or you are trying to manage your capital and so you don't feel confident admitting this publicly. But your own words seems, seem to acknowledge that you know that the brethren have been knowingly misleading us for generations. And I'll go on to show how your own words acknowledge this because you, Richard Bushman, go on to say, Elder Packer had this sense of protecting the little people. He felt like the scholars were an enemy to this faith. For me, as I understand the implications of what you just said, Richard Bushman, you said that Elder Packer was protecting the testimonies of grandmothers by not allowing them to know the church's true and accurate history. You're saying that, Richard Bushman, that you acknowledge that Elder Packer was hiding the truthful history from the members to protect, in your words, the grandmothers. But that acknowledges intentional misleading or misrepresentation, the withholding of information. As I understand your statement, Richard Bushman, you are acknowledging, and of course, Richard Bushman, if you were willing to come on Mormon Stories podcast or appear in other unsanctioned forums, you would acknowledge that it isn't just Boyd K. Packer, right? It was Bruce R. McConkie, right? It was Ezra Tapp Benson, right? It was Harold B. Lee, right? It was Joseph Fielding Smith, right? It was Gordon B. Hinckley, right? It was Dallin H. Oaks, right? It's all of them. They've been doing this since the 19 teens, withholding this information. It's not just Elder Packer. And I don't think you're being fully uh, candid when you kind of put it on um, Elder Packer. So I think I've made that point. I hope you guys don't feel like I've been super unfair, um, but I think, I, I think I'm reading your statements accurately and I don't think I'm misinterpreting what you said. Okay, here are some more questions I would have for you, Richard Bushman. In regard to your statement, Elder Packer had this sense of protecting the little people. Um, I would just ask you, Richard Bushman, do you regret or do you denounce that the Mormon church has silenced or excommunicated so many honest and credible Mormon scholars? Grant Palmer, Michael Quinn, Paul and Margaret Triscano, Levina Fielding Anderson. And, and don't call, you know, not all of us are scholars or, or at least scholars in the realm of Mormon history, but Bill Reel, Jeremy Runnels, me, Leah and Cody Young, Carson and Marisa Calderwood, um, so many people have been excommunicated for telling the truth. Fawn Brody, you quote Fawn Brody, Richard Bushman, more than any other source, as I understand it, more than any other historian. She was excommunicated by the leaders you sustain as prophet seers and revelators. Do you denounce and regret the silencing and the excommunication of all these people? In other words, people were excommunicated for things that you wrote in Rough Stone Rolling. People have been excommunicated for things that you helped support in the Gospel Topics essays. Do you denounce it, Richard Bushman? And if so, why haven't you publicly stated that? Why haven't you publicly called the church out for silencing truth-telling historians and podcasters and, you know, uh, truth-tellers for generations? Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't that be an act of courage and maybe even an act of integrity to say that publicly if you, um, if you believe it? And I don't know if you believe it, but I would love the chance to ask you if you believe it. I tend to think you do, but I wonder why you wouldn't acknowledge or say that publicly. Okay, next question for Richard Bushman. Again, his statement, but the price of protecting the grandmothers was the loss of the grandsons. I, you know, I don't want to be too hard. Um, I, I don't want to be too hard on Richard Bushman for an off the cuff statement that he makes, you know, to, to a group of, uh, people in a basement somewhere. But, um, but, but, but I, I have a problem with this framing of Packer wanted to protect the grandmothers. But then this is your words, Richard Bushman, that came at the cost of, of the grandsons. Those were your words of protecting the grand, you know, the church is losing the grandsons because it was 
um, try to protect, you know, the grandmothers. Here's my question, Richard Bushman. Why didn't you say to that group that, that um, you know, the price of, of the dishonesty, the price of the deception, the price of the misleading or the teaching of a, of a false narrative, that that price was, um, you know, the, the, the harm done to not just the grandmothers, but the grandfathers, the children, the parents, the grandchildren, not just the sons, but of all genders. Why aren't you, Richard Bushman, concerned about the lack of informed consent, about the fact that so many generations were misled into devotion to the church by being taught a false narrative that then led them to give their time, their reputation, their money uh, to the church under false pretenses? Have you ever expressed, Richard Bushman, regret for that huge disservice, not just to the grandmothers, but to all of us for generations. We deserved to join the church or to be indoctrinated into the church under a truthful narrative that the brethren knew, that they had the full set of information, that they're still withholding much of the truth they're withholding in secret private vaults to this day. Didn't we all deserve to be taught the truth by the leaders who had all the documents and had all the information? And if we weren't taught the truth, isn't that a huge disservice and a huge injustice that's been committed on all of us and perpetrated on all of us, not just the grandmothers? And, sh and, and, and Richard Bushman, do you regret that? Do you um, denounce that? Do you express remorse for that? I would love to know the answer to that question. And of course, I'm not blaming you for that. You've done your part to help make things better. But why haven't you ever expressed regret that so many people were misled? And then if you add to that all the people that were harmed by the church and its truth claims, all that harm comes on the back of, of so many generations being misled and indoctrinated into the church under false pretenses. Richard Bushman, I would love some writing, some expression of an acknowledgement by you of the harm that's been done by the lack of informed consent and by this deception. My next question to you, Richard Bushman, is um, in, in response to your statement, so we've just had to change our narrative. I would just ask you, why didn't you frame that as now we've had to start telling the truth. It's not just about changing the narrative because truth exists. Historical facts exist. Historical evidence exists. There is a sense of truth within history. Nobody's arguing that Abraham Lincoln existed. Nobody's arguing that Thomas Jefferson existed or that there's a document called the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. There are historical truths. And, and the Mormon church has misled us, not just in a, um, you know, a narrative that was suboptimal. They have withheld factual information from us and have taught us an untrue narrative intentionally. So it's not just about the church changing its narrative to making it um, you know, uh, better. It's the church starting to tell the truth. And I wish you would frame it that way because the church has misled us for so long. Regarding, again, the statement, will we leave room to experience Mormonism in different ways? That's the question Bushman is asking church leadership. I would just say, why isn't the question more something to the effect of, will the church apologize for teaching a false history and misleading its members and apologize to the many people it's silenced and punished for speaking the truth? Will the church repent and atone for its mistakes like it teaches its members to do? And I'm just wondering, Richard Bushman, why have you never called the Mormon church to repent and to admit and to own up to its deception and to its misleading of the members? I, I, I think I can guess why. But I think that that is an ethical and a consistent and a responsible thing to expect the church to do. A couple more responses to Bushman's uh, statement. He wrote, we don't want to break up our community. 
which is our greatest strength and the beauty of the church in the name of finding some abstract truth that works better for each one of us. Well, I would just again ask you this question, Richard Bushman. Is it really a matter of abstract truth or is it a matter of evidence and telling the truth? How much of your testimony, Richard Bushman, is based on truth versus on goodness or clean living or community? I would just say to you that most of us, many of us, were sold into the church, converted into the church, or indoctrinated into the church, not based on goodness, not based on community and the healthiness of the community. We were indoctrinated into or converted to the Mormon church based on its truth, based on its historical truth claims. And so it's a bit of a bait and switch to now say, oh, we can't lose the community. The community is what's really important. It's what's most important. The church's goodness is what's most important. That becomes a bait and switch because that's not what we were sold into. And that's not what investigators were sold into. Um, we'll go on. Uh, Richard Bushman has this uh, really um involved statement that he actually published as part of a peggy fletcher stack q a that was published in the salt lake tribune recently and i'm going to go ahead and read um a further clarification that bushman made these are bushman's words that are printed in the salt lake tribune he wrote quote the book of mormon is a problem right now i think that's an understatement um he goes on to write it's so baffling to so many that Joseph was not even looking at the gold plates to translate them. And there's so much in the Book of Mormon that comes out of the 19th century that there's a question of whether or not the text is an extant, is an exact transcription of Nephi's and Mormon's words, or if it has been reshaped by inspiration to be more suitable for us, a kind of an expansion or elucidation of the Nephite record for our times. I have no idea how that might have worked or whether that's true, but there are just too many scholars now, faithful church scholars who find 19th century material in that text. That remains a bit of a mystery, just how it came to be. Well, my question to you is, Richard Bushman, as you acknowledge the serious problem we're dealing with in the 21st century, which is the Book of Mormon really is 19th century Bible fan fiction written by Joseph Smith. And the horses and the steel and the wheels and the helmets and the, sh and the you know, Deutero Isaiah and the New Testament, plagiarized New Testament, all of these anachronisms and plagiarisms, the mound builder myth, that have clearly been infused into the Book of Mormon, like from the view of the Hebrews, inspired by the view of the Hebrews and other texts like it, the late war. Obviously, the Book of Mormon is this massive plagiarized, um, you know, example of Joseph Smith's 19th century Bible fan fiction. That's something that is just so blatantly obvious to us now in the 21st century. Why do you frame it as, quote, a bit of a mystery? and that you're not understanding the problem. Uh, is this a viable way to describe what we're dealing with here? Or are you grossly um, understating the problem that we have in front of us? We were taught that Joseph Smith looked in the Yermum Thummim, the plates were on a desk, that he was using the spectacles to look at the plates and that the words to the Book of Mormon would appear in the Urimum Thummim and that Joseph would read those to the scribes. That's what we were all taught. We were taught that this was sort of some amalgamation of, of Joseph Smith's understanding of the world and his cultural influences that were then mixed with his attempts to translate through a stone and a hat when the plates were in the forest, according to Joseph Smith, but clearly not even in the room. Like that is not a credible narrative by any stretch. And for you, Richard Bushman, to pretend that somehow, oh, it's a bit of a mystery. How did this translation happen? How can it still be a, a you know, um, how can there still have been golden plates, uh, but the plates weren't in the room? And how can this still have been an, an ancient record of Native Americans, which I do think Richard Bushman believes, 
how can it be all of that and have all this massive evidence for fraud and, and plagiarism in the book and anachronisms? Those two things aren't sustainable. And Richard Bushman, frankly, you're too intelligent uh, to not realize that. So for you to couch it as a bit of a mystery, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but there's something that's not right about the way you're couching it in this explanation. It's much more than a bit of a problem or a bit of a mystery. It's a massive, massive fatal blow to the credibility of the Book of Mormon as a historical document. And you know this, and I think we deserve a more further explanation from you than calling it a bit of a mystery. I think you need to acknowledge the severity of the problem and calling it a bit of a mystery, I just don't think uh, does it quite um, enough justice. Um, with respect, but I'm being honest and I'm being frank, I know that you're revered as this sort of sacred Mormon historian, but given your reputation, given the accolades, giving your fame, given the respect, given your credibility as a historian, Harvard and Columbia, and all the honor and praise and, and respect that's been heaped upon you, and given the stakes of how many people have been harmed by the false narrative that you now acknowledge, I think you can actually answer this question. I think you owe it to us to answer this question with a little bit more directness and a little bit more information than calling it a bit of a mystery. It's a massive problem to the credibility of the book. The book is in jeopardy. It's in free fall. And anyone who is like, who's speaking freely and openly and honestly, I think will acknowledge that. All right. Next question for you with respect, Richard Bushman. You wrote, quote, so it's going to be its struggle for the next decade, meaning the church's struggle, I don't know, two or three decades as we go through this process. Um, you know, something that I, I don't think I've ever hear you, heard you really speak about, Richard Bushman, and I'm going to be speaking about this later, but, but do you have remorse or concern about not only the church misleading generations of members, and the collateral, but, but, but also the collateral damage done to certain subgroups within the church, LGBT people, um, mixed faith marriages, all the marriages that have been destroyed over discrepancies in faith and people learning about the problematic history and then having their spouses divorce them and leave them and take the kids, all the parents that have disowned or cut themselves off from their um, non-believing children once they lost their faith, you know, you know, do you have concerns about that in the collateral damage? I would love to hear your views on the LGBTQ suicides, on the way that women have been, uh, you know, taught that their potential is far less than it actually is, the way they've been um, jammed into, you know, square holes as round, you know, round pegs. I, you know, do you lament, Richard Bushman, the number of divorces, the, the, um, you know, the number of people who've experienced anxiety and depression and significant distress over the faith crisis, over grappling with having been misled, and all the social and familial and collateral damage that has been done. Why, Richard Bushman, have I never heard you talk about this publicly? Maybe I've missed it. If I've missed it, can someone please share with me Richard Bushman's impassioned you know, expression of remorse or regret for all the harm that's been done to all the people who believed the false narrative that Richard Bushman now acknowledges. Again, including the thousands and thousands of LGBTQ suicides. Where has Richard Bushman ever spoke about this? And Richard Bushman, if you haven't spoke about this, why haven't you? And would you be willing to speak uh, about this now? All right. That is kind of my, uh, I don't want to say SmackDown. That is my um, analysis of a combination of his Faith Again statement and his Peggy Fletcher Stack interview that he did recently um, uh, trying to address and I, I believe respond to, you know, rumors about whether he really does still believe in the church's truth claims, which again, he does. He believes in golden plates. He believes in angels. He believes this church is somehow divine. I don't understand that. 
I think probably the biggest question I received from listeners is, Richard Bushman, you're intelligent, you're smart, you've seen all the problems more than anybody. How can you still believe that there really were golden plates, that there really are angels, and that um, you know that that the Book of Mormon is an actual actual ancient record? And I I think. You've told us in my Mormon Stories podcast interview from 2007, you even said, if I recall, that you don't like to frame it as a, you know, as a, as a, as a matter of the church being true. It's more about the church being good. And then you talk a lot about the community and how important the community is and how good, um, you know, the church and the gospel of, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, how good it makes people become. Um, I think that's where your testimony seems to really lie. And I think that's what you've said. And because you feel so strongly about those things, then uh, you're willing to hold open the possibility that there are angels or plates. That's my interpretation of what you've said, but I would love clarification on that. But now I'm going to share with you, Richard Bushman, questions from me and or from our listeners that I just think are really good questions. And I think uh, we all are are going to um, benefit from hearing these questions because there are a lot of truths in these questions. So yes, these are questions. Yes, Richard Bushman's not here to answer them, but check out the wisdom and the truth in the questions that our listeners or I have put forward. So questions to you, Richard Bushman. Number one, um, you've sometimes framed your Mormon testimony as being rooted in the, the Mormon gospel leading to good behavior or the vibrant Mormon community. This is my question to you, Richard Bushman, and I'm kind of summarizing what I just said. Are these sound bases for epistemo epistemological commitment? especially if other churches or even cults can make the very same claims. In other words, people who followed Jim Jones said that it was a great community they were a part of. People who followed the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh in Northern Oregon, you know, if you watch the documentary Wild Wild Country, they would say the community they had following Bhagwan Rajneesh was the most beautiful time of their lives. Um, just because a community is beautiful has nothing to do with the church being true and what it claims to be. And just because, you know, the Mormon way of life makes some people act in moral and ethical ways, you've got 6 billion plus other people, 7 billion other people plus on the earth who many of them are acting in highly ethical or moral ways. So, you know, is it, is it a satisfactory basis of your epistemological foundation to be rooted in the goodness of the Mormon church and the goodness of the Mormon community? I, I think that's a fair question. The next question, Richard Bushman, uh, Sean writes, I've heard that some general leadership or general authorities, and I would even say, this is John speaking, uh, apostles and first presidency members of the Mormon church. We have all heard that many of these people in the church consider rough stone rolling to be quote, anti-Mormon close quote. Is there any merit to this? And if so, has it affected your reputation with the church leadership? Thank you, Sean, for asking that question. I'm just going to add that I've gone around the world and I've asked now tens of thousands of people who have lost their faith in the Mormon church, what was the cause of them leaving their church? Guess what one of the top 10 answers is? Maybe even top five, rough stone rolling. It's like Mormon Stories podcast, CES letter, year of polygamy with Lindsay Hanson Park, Bill Real, Radio Free Mormon, you know, the gospel topics essays, and rough stone rolling. It's always in the top eight, rough stone rolling. And so I think it's an interesting question to ask. Is it true what many of us have heard that many of the members of the First Presidency of the Quorum of the Twelve view rough stone rolling as an anti-Mormon book? I would love to answer that question. I'm sure you have information that you can share with us on that, Richard Bushman. Um, we would love to know. I'm guessing the answer is yes from my sources. Next question. Um, many of us would ask you, Richard Bushman, what, what do you define as an apologist? And do you, Richard Bushman, consider yourself to be an apologist for the Mormon church? Now, many in the Mormon studies of the Mormon 
scholarly community take umbrage at even the question. I even had someone write that, um, you know, to call Richard Bushman, uh, you know, an apologist waters down the meaning of that word to where it's literally, um, you know, kind of meaningless. And all I would say is that, no, I think that an apologist can be defined as a defender of the faith. And Richard Bushman defends the faith. He absolutely has spent his career defending the faith. So by that definition, he is an apologist. And so I'm just curious whether he would own up to that or not, if he would like that term um, or not. Um, so uh, that's our next question to you, Richard Bushman. The next question to you, um, this is from Patrick. Uh, this is a combination of a question from Patrick and a question from me. Why are so many of the Mormon church's top historians lawyers and not actual historians? We're talking about Marlon Jensen. We're talking about Richard Turley. We're talking about Stephen Snow. Leaders of the church history department for generations have been lawyers, not historians. Uh, even Joseph Fielding Smith, even B.H. Roberts weren't official historians. We'll give B.H. Roberts a break. Joseph Fielding Smith, not a historian. Why is the church afraid to call actual historians to lead the church history department? And even more disturbingly, why do they call lawyers for decades to lead the church history department? What does that tell us? What does that mean, Richard Bushman? Why did they call you to be leader of the church history department, Richard Bushman? Uh, why, why, uh, why don't they call historians? Why did they call lawyers? I think that speaks volumes. And I would love to get your take on that, Richard Bushman. Next question for Richard Bushman. What has been the impact of the Gospel Topics essays on member disaffection? Has it accelerated or decelerated the disaffection? And how is inoculation working? I can tell you my impression. My impression is, is the, go the Gospel Topics essays have been the impetus to tens of thousands of people starting their faith crisis and ultimately leaving the church. I think the Gospel Topics essays have backfired for the church. They, they were, you know, the church was forced to release them for legal reasons alone so that people couldn't instigate more fraud cases against the Mormon church for knowingly deceiving people, which it was doing for generations and which Richard Bushman even admitted. But the Gospel Topics essays, let's make no mistake, they were released because the church was embarrassed and forced to release them for legal reasons and for ethical and moral reasons that we and many others forced them, backed them into a corner to release them. What's the verdict? It seems like the verdict is the Gospel Topics essays have been a disaster for people remaining in the church, as has Rough Stone Rolling. I and we would love to hear Richard Bushman's take on um, whether that's his impression as well, and just generally speaking, whether the church's attempt to inoculate members now through the Joseph Smith Papers Project, to uh, through the Gospel Topics essays, through Rough Stone Rolling and other, through the through the book Saints which is a really poor example of scholarship, whether this inoculation has been working or not from the standpoint of Richard Bushman. I would love to have him answer that question. Next question for Richard Bushman. Um, is changing the narrative to the Book of Mormon being revelation instead of translation or pseudepigrapha or the Book of Abraham or the Book of Mormon being pseudepigrapha or basically text written um, by someone claiming to be the original author. So me writing as Paul when I'm not Paul, me writing as Nephi when I'm not Nephi. If we're going to retreat to calling parts of the Book of Mormon or the Book of Abraham pseudepigrapha, or retreat from calling the Book of Mormon or the Book of Abraham translations and instead call them revelations, um, or, you know, the catalyst theory, inspirations. Isn't that a bait and switch? Aren't we basically taking Joseph Smith's own claims of being a translator? Aren't we basically taking the, the predominant narrative that all of us were either uh, indoctrinated into or converts were sold into that Joseph translated from golden plates to the Book of Mormon, translated from Egyptian papyrus into the Book of Abraham? Isn't now 
reframing that and calling it revelation or pseudepigrapha or inspiration, isn't that a massive bait and switch that requires the church to apologize and make restitution for misleading people for so long? And aren't you Richard Bushman and Spencer Fluman and Patrick Mason and all the members of the Maxwell Institute and all the people of Fair Mormon, aren't you engaging in the gaslighting and in the deceiving um, uh, uh, of members today by trying to finesse us into this change of a bait and switch without there ever being an apology and a reconciliation? Aren't you aiding and abetting in the bait and switch and in the deception and the gaslighting of past members who have less, left their faith by using your scholarship, your academics, your books, your articles to sort of like, and your academic credibility to massage members into a pseudepigrapha, um, you know, inspired, uh, you know, revelation, new framing for these texts. Aren't you aiding and abetting um, that bait and switch in that deception. I fear that you are, and I would just love to hear your answer to that. How do you answer that? Um, you know, shouldn't apologists call on the church to make things right, to apologize and to make restitution, or at least openly acknowledge publicly the deception and the misteachings before they try and give us a new spin and a new uh, approach for looking at, at, at scripture. This is one of the main problems I have had and continue to have with, with thoughtful, kind, intelligent uh, Mormon apologists. Next question for uh, Richard Bushman. Um, is straining to redefine the word translation? And just to give a little background, when I was at Utah State University, there was a whole one or two day conference where Rosalind Welch and, and Richard Bushman and Philip Barlow and, and uh, Terrell Givens and, and um, all of these, you know, Mark, I forget his name, all of these scholars spending two days at Utah State University trying to redefine what the word translation means so that we don't have to reach kind of Occam's razor's obvious conclusion, which is the Book of Mormon and the Book of Abraham you know, were fan fiction or, you know, works of 19th century fiction or frauds so that we don't have to go down that route. What we have to do is redefine what the word translation means and then spend, you know, days or years or tomes of, of, of apologetics redefining the word translation. Isn't that whole endeavor, isn't that whole act an act of academic or intellectual desperation fueled by the need for the narrative to stay credible? I think that's a fair question. And I would love for Mormon scholars to address that question directly instead of just gaslighting us and trying to use this bait and switch finesse to a new narrative that isn't what we were taught, isn't what prophets, seers, and revelators taught for centuries, and isn't what Joseph Smith himself claimed. Um, I think it's a fundamental act of deception uh, to engage in that um, sort of behavior on the part of apologists who I love and respect. I just disagree with what you're doing. You will disagree with what I'm doing. Anybody who thinks that this podcast episode is unkind or unfair, hey, listen, I guarantee you that Terrell and Fiona Givens, Richard Bushman, Patrick Mason, Spencer Fluman, all of those apologists have very sharp things to say about me privately or publicly, and they will, and they have, and they do. And I would just say, can I not speak publicly um, directly back to them? Is that mean or unspirited, especially given the number of people who've been harmed, the, the amount of time and money that's been spent dedicated to the church under a false and fraudulent narrative? Is it too much for these people funded, bankrolled, whose salaries and pensions um, are, are literally funded either directly or indirectly through the church? Is it too much for them to ask these to answer? Is it too much to ask for these apologists funded by the church to, to receive and to answer some of these more difficult questions? Or are they going to continue to hide behind their non-peer-reviewed uh, pseudo-academic articles and books and uh, podcasts 
and forums where they don't have to actually take hard questions. Am I being mean and unfair or are they not uh, standing up and, and having integrity and facing the hard questions, which I believe is in the spirit of true scholarship, uh, frankly. Uh, okay, some of the more tough questions now, we haven't gotten to the tough questions. Here they go. Carrie asks, Richard Bushman, do you believe, as stated in Doctrine and Covenants 132, that polygamy will be practiced in the celestial kingdom? I get, I am going to guess that Richard Bushman would sort of say, we don't really know everything about that. There's a lot of uncertainty. Um, you know, that's fine, but it's in Doctrine and Covenants 132. So Richard Bushman, can you please, would you ever in any forum, just tell us, what are your personal beliefs? Do you believe section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants that, that polygamy is part of the new and everlasting covenant. And like past Mormon prophets and apostles have taught, polygamy will be a requirement for exaltation in the celestial kingdom in the hereafter. What do you believe, Richard Bushman? Carrie wants to know. I want to know. A lot of my listeners want to know. Cheryl wants to know, Richard Bushman, do you believe Joseph Smith was a person of integrity? In other words, do you believe Joseph Smith was an honest person? I think I remember hearing you say once, Richard Bushman, that once you started digging in to the evidence about Joseph Smith, you asked yourself whether or not you would emerge from your studying of Joseph Smith liking Joseph Smith because you encountered so many problems reading about him. Now, I know that you've emerged loving Joseph Smith and believing in Joseph Smith still as a prophet. But here's our question for you, Richard Bushman. How honest was Joseph Smith? Was he a person of integrity? Or at his core, was he sometimes a fraud, a, you know, a charlatan? Was he a fraud or a charlatan? What do you think, Richard Bushman? Where do you come down on Joseph Smith's integrity? Next question for Richard Bushman. This is from my dear friend, Alan Mount. Love you, Alan Mount. Marry on a, marriage on a tightrope. Excellent podcast. Alan asks Richard Bushman, would you allow your 16-year-old granddaughter to be alone with Joseph Smith for two hours? I think that's a great question, Alan Mount. And Richard Bushman, I think that's a great question. Would you let your granddaughter be alone with Joseph Smith for hours or days? If yes, I'd love to understand how you would justify that. If no, I would love to understand how he's still a prophet in your eyes and you wouldn't even trust him with your own granddaughter. Follow-up question. This one is from Bill Real. Love you, Bill Real. Richard Bushman, would you allow your 15-year-old granddaughter to work inside Joseph Smith's home as a nanny or as a maid or as a live-in servant? Would you, Richard, Richard Bushman, would you allow your granddaughter to work in the Joseph Smith home if you could teleport yourself back uh, to the 1830s? Fanny Alger, anyone? Um, I would love to hear your answer to that question, Richard Bushman, directly. Next question, Richard Bushman, by Mark. By your estimation, how many women did Joseph Smith have sex with without Emma's consent? Best guess. We all know inexplicably that in defiance of the code in, in, in the, revela the revelation, I say in air quotes, of Doctrine and Covenants 132, Emma Smith was like the 20-something wife sealed to Joseph Smith. In other words, Joseph Smith defied DNC 132 or his own revelation was sealed to 20 plus other women before Emma was even sealed to him and before Emma even knew about polygamy. So he lied and misled Emma. Okay. That we all know. And I think Richard Bushman, you would even acknowledge that a follow on question to that Richard Bushman would be how many women did Joseph Smith have sex with without Emma's knowledge or consent? I think you know, I think you have a good idea, Richard Bushman, as to how many of those women Joseph Smith had sex with, hiding from his wife, Emma, defying DNC 132. Would you be willing to answer that question directly? It's actually an empirical question. You probably don't have evidence, but you have a good sense for it. And I think it'd be a really valuable question for you, Richard Bushman, to answer. Next question from Annie Richard Bushman. By your estimation, were any of Joseph Smith's extramarital relationships adulterous and not sanctioned by God? If so, which ones? This is a great question. It's a great question from a woman. We know that Fanny Alger 
when Joseph Smith was caught having sex with Fanny Alger in a barn, Oliver Cowdery, a member of the First Presidency, one of the three witnesses, alleged scribe to the Book of Mormon, he called that a dirty, filthy, nasty affair, which Joseph Smith excommunicated him for. So we know that at least one of those relationships, by many accounts, was an affair and not a polygamous marriage. Um, or a you know an eternal marriage as it's called by by Brian Hales and others. So Richard Bushman, I think this is a wonderful question. We would love to hear from you on how were any of Joseph Smith's extramarital relationships not eternal marriages, but instead just plain old adultery. Great question, Annie. Next question from Eric: Does Richard Bushman realize that his softening of hard truths? And then uh, Eric writes, this is a nice way of saying his obscuring the reality that the extru exclusive truth claims and resultant authority of church leadership is unearned and not reality based. Eric asks, does Richard Bushman realize that this hurts people like Eric um, and his ex-wife and all their children? In other, Richard Bush in other words, Richard Bushman, and this is something I've already mentioned in this podcast. Do you, Richard Bushman, realize that the false narrative that the church, um, that you claim to believe in, that the prophets, seers, and revelators, that you, Richard Bushman, sustain, do you realize that the false narrative that they taught generations has harmed countless men, women, and children, and families for generations? And that your apologetics, your apologetics of softening and making these uh, very unpleasant historical truths, making them more palatable for many people contributes to the ongoing damage and harm. Richard Bushman, do you realize that? I would love to hear your answer to that. Or do you think that that's an unfair charge by Eric and by tens of thousands of others who were frustrated by the apologetic soft peddling that they read in Rough Stone Rolling? Um, I think that's a great question. All right, next question. And this one is um, quite in depth. And so uh, I'll, I'll apologize ahead of time that this one's hard to read. Here's the question by Ryan. I've heard Mr. Bushman say he believes Joseph Smith's glass looking and peepstone use was Joseph Smith just practicing his powers, almost auditioning for his role as prophet. Ryan goes on to write, as if glass looking and scamming people in using peepstones to find treasure was a perfectly fine moral thing and that the and that the magic of it was real. Ryan asks, would Richard say that about all the others who dabbled in peepstones and folk magic? Does he also use this positive sounding rhetoric on other magical items like crystal balls and magic wands and dousing rods and tarot cards? How does one tell the difference between Joseph's peepstone treasure digging being real magic and the other people doing the same thing, but it being just a trick or fraud or scams? Eric Ryan asks, I guess I just wonder if his logic is biased towards Joseph Smith. Um, or Ryan asks, is a trick just a trick? Is a scam just a scam? Were most people that used a seer stone faking it to get gain? Was Joseph Smith faking it to get gain when he admitted himself to people close to the situation that he never really could see anything in the stone in the hat as it related to the treasure digging? Was it just a scam to get gain? And why hasn't Richard Bushman ever acknowledged that that's probably what was going on? Ryan goes on to write, was Joseph the only one actually seeing the rock light up in a hat, even though he found no treasure in it? It seems rational to say all peepstones were trickery or foolery. I think Ryan is asking a great question, Richard Bushman, and I would love to hear your answers to that. Next question. Um, Another listener wrote, I've heard that many of Richard Bushman's own family members have left the church oh, or no longer believe in the church. Um, I will say, incidentally, I've heard the same thing about 
most of the apologists, the prominent Mormon apologists that you are aware of in 2021, you just, you know, as long as they have adult children or adult grandchildren, you have large numbers of their children or grandchildren who have left the church. Mormon apologists, Mormon apostles, Mormon general authorities, et cetera, et cetera. So given that, 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 that Richard Bushman, many of Richard Bushman's own children um, or grandchildren uh, no longer believe in the church, and given that so many LDS church members continue to leave the church in droves, in spite of, in spite of Richard Bushman's best efforts to defend the faith, who, Richard Bushman, do you see as responsible for this situation? Is it God? Is it the prophets, seers, and revelators who you sustain? Is it the people that didn't, you know, read the right books? Um, you know, is it the bishops and the stake presidents who excommunicated the scholars? Is it the apologists that misled people for generations? Where, Richard Bushman, do you pin the accountability for this huge catastrophic disaster, which is the unraveling and the hemorrhaging and the fall of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the 21st century? Um, and if you reconcile, if you believe Richard Bushman that this is God's one true church on the earth with whom the church, with whom the Lord is well pleased, which the Doctrine and Covenant states, how do you reconcile that with God, God's fairness, God's power, God's compassion? How do you make sense of all that? Um, uh, you know, we would love to hear some sort of explanation. I think that's a fair question uh, that people uh, would like to know. All right, Richard Bushman, a few other questions and then I'll be done. Richard Bushman, what are the most troubling things you have learned or discovered as a historian that would be damaging to member faith? Or more candidly, that in the spirit of full disclosure or informed consent, what are the most troubling things you, Richard Bushman, have discovered as a historian that, that members deserve to know? Or are you keeping those to yourself or hiding them or spinning them um, or not acknowledging them? Uh, or are you keeping them to yourself or only sharing them in basements, in private settings, or on one-on-one -on -one settings with select people? Are you, Richard Bushman, sharing all the evidence that you know that would be important and relevant to allow an individual to engage in the basic principles of informed consent and know what it is that they are giving or will give their lives and 10% 10 10 of their income to in perpetuity, not just for the rest of their lives, but for eternity. Let us know, Richard Bushman, what information have you not yet shared with us that we deserve to know? Next question. To what extent, Richard Bushman, does the Mormon church leadership ever embarrass you? Are you embarrassed by Boyd K. Packer? Are you embarrassed by the behavior of Joseph Fielding Smith? Are you embarrassed by the behavior of Joseph Smith? Are you embarrassed by the way that the church excommunicated and punished its scholars and silenced them for generations? Are you embarrassed today at how Dallin H. Oaks and Russell M. Nelson continue to cause severe harm to the LGBT community, to women, um, to, to falsely mislead members about their own prophetic power and their own access to divine revelation. Are you embarrassed, Richard Bushman, um, by modern Mormon church leadership? And frankly, either their lack of knowledge about important things or their lack of character or integrity about doing what is right and letting the consequences follow. Elder Oaks's statement that we do not either um, seek nor offer apologies. Does that embarrass you, Richard Bushman, when Elder Dallin H. Oaks says that the church doesn't apologize, that the church won't follow its own teachings of repentance? Richard Bushman, um, does that embarrass you? If so, would you ever have the courage or the integrity to state that publicly before you pass on? Would you be willing to let us know? Um, or, if you, or if you're not embarrassed by them, if you think they're awesome, and if you think their historical behavior over the, over the past 100 to 200 years has been amazing and high examples of character and integrity, will you just say that so we can at least know where you stand? Because few people know where the bodies are buried as much as you, Richard Bushman. 
Um, next question. Um, um, so, uh, I would ask you, this is sort of a combination of a question for me, but from also many other listeners, Richard Bushman, you were asked by Peggy Fletcher stack in your article in the Salt Lake Tribune, how have you seen the church evolve over the decades on race, racism, feminism, or LGBTQ issues? And now I'd like to read to you Richard Bush, Bush Richard Bushman's statement. And I'm going to preface it by saying he doesn't say the church has harmed way too many people. He doesn't say, I lament and regret all the LGBTQ suicides and all the depression and anxiety and the lives lost by LGBTQ members engaging in conversion therapy or mixed orientation marriages or celibacy at the recommendation of the church and its top leadership. You don't hear Richard Bushman lament all the women who did not meet their potential because they were taught to not get all the education that they could and instead to just fill the role of being a mommy um, and all the racism and all the racist teachings. You don't hear Richard Bushman talk about how he laments all the harm that, that's been done. This is what Richard Bushman says in answer to Peggy Fletcher Stack's question. I subsume this category into what I call cosmopolitanism, which is one of the most powerful influences in the church right now. By cosmopolitanism, I mean that we're suddenly able to see ourselves as others see us, and we can picture ourselves as one religion among a number of other re of, of religions and a number of viewpoints. We can see how Mormonism looks from a global view. And as soon as we do that, then the way we treat women becomes problematic in terms of the way the educated world in general is looking upon women and race and LGBTQ issues and so on. We have to find ways of couching our message so that it makes sense to the world at large. At the same time, we need to hold on to our roots in a parochial way. I mean that in a positive sense. We all, even the most cosmopolitan people, need a home base in Mormonism. We'll keep trying to find words that will allow us to express what we believe in a way that's acceptable. We want to sound like we're reasonable souls. I see the merits of that, but that relieves us of the responsibility of, the, of defending the things that are uniquely ours, like angels and gold plates that should be protected. So that's Richard Bushman's response to the church's centuries-long history of racism and sexism and homophobia, and Richard Bushman's own acknowledged history of, of, of teaching the church members and investigators a false narrative, uh, unknowingly teaching them a false narrative. The way Richard Bushman wants to frame it in is, number one, within the context of this notion of cosmopolitanism, that it's just sort of like progressivism. And now that the church is being confronted with cosmopolitanism and progressivism, now it's seeing how the church sees them and now it's having to learn to, what does he say? Find new words that allow the church to express what it believes in a way that's acceptable. Here's my question to you, Richard Bushman. What does it mean to be a prophet, seer, and revelator? What does it mean when you're sustaining them as prophets, seers, and revelators, as men who literally talk to God and know the mind and the will of God in some sort of privileged way that the rest of us plebeian members don't know? What does that mean when you when you sustain them? What value is it? Um, what value do they offer us if they're always two or three generations behind the times on the most prevalent and important uh, moment, civil rights issues, the Equal Rights Amendment, the Civil Rights Movement, feminism, trans rights, LGBT rights, you know, voting rights, whatever it is. You know, what does it mean to be a prophet, seer, and revelator? And when you frame it as them now seeing how the world sees us in a cosmopolitan lens, and now we've got to find the right words, is that really how you're going to frame it? Versus just saying, yeah, we need to look again at what, what it means to be a prophet, seer, and revelator. They've oversold their power. They've oversold their authority to us. 
They've asked for too much power and we've given them way too much power. And we need to rein that sucker. We need to rein that puppy way back in and call it as we see it and say, they're just as right to get it. They're just as likely to get it catastrophically wrong as they are to get it right. And if that's the case, and if the stakes are so high, LGBTQ suicides, divorces, failed families, racism, all of that stuff, if the stakes are that high, then we need to like call an emergency meeting where we say, hey, everybody, there's a huge problem, way too much collateral damage and pain. <clears throat> we need to call like a Vatican II within Mormonism and readjust everyone's expectation to stop the harm and to start the stop the fraud and to stop the deception. Isn't that the way we should be framing this, Richard Bushman, instead of framing it in terms of cosmopolitanism and the need to find new words to express what we believe in a way that, what do you say, in a way that's acceptable? acceptable that's what god does is he is he you know tells the human race to object to all the damage the mormon church has done so that then prophets learn to use new words so that now that the world will find the church acceptable i just don't understand it richard bushman can you please help us understand your uh explanations here better um, because I'm just going to say it. I am on the ground floor of this. I am seeing the divorces. I am seeing the death by suicide. I am seeing the, the, the anxiety and the depression and all the problems as, as someone who got a PhD in psychology, as someone who meets with these people daily, it's a bigger problem than just learning to come up with a new narrative that helps the world understand us better by using the right words because, oh my gosh, cosmopolitanism. There's a serious problem. And I wish you, Richard Bushman, would use your power, use your privilege, use your influence to call the church on it and to help um, make more uh, accelerated change than the decades long pace, the super slow, tedious, archaic nonogenarian pace that we're on right now that you acknowledge is going to take generations to fix um so to go on richard bushman uh do you ever feel frustrated that in your role as a mormon historian you are not able to speak plainly about the harm that the church causes to so many marginalized communities and as a follow-up to that do you ever feel like your comfort as a church member is largely a function of your privilege as a white straight man who's multi-generational in the church and who has this huge reputation built on being the guy who stands up for Joseph Smith, um, who gets to go to the special firesides, who gets to go to the special meetings, who gets to sit in that privileged endowed chair at Claremont or, or at BYU and the Maxwell Institute all of these drippings of privilege is it possible that those drippings of privilege are what um, allow you to stay in your position of comfort and to not speak more publicly and openly and candidly about the harm that's being caused um next question i'm almost done i promise i think we're going to beat two hours here next question for richard bushman this comes from sam what historical evidence, Richard Bushman, and I would add, what harmful acts by Mormon church prophets, seers, and revelators would definitely refute the foundational truth claims of the LDS church for you? In other words, what evidence or action would be beyond apologetics, beyond excuses? Or in other words, Richard Bushman, can you please answer this question? What would it take to get you to see that the Mormon church isn't what it claims to be, to see that Joseph Smith was a fraud and a charlatan, to see that the Book of Mormon is nothing more than 19th century fan, you know, New Testament Bible fan fiction um, written by Joseph Smith. What would it take? What would it take? Would we need a photograph or a video anachronistically of Joseph Smith telling Oliver that it was a fraud? What would it take, Richard Bushman? Would it take other documents being released from church archives? 
So many of us would want to know what is your standard? I'm sure you don't think Richard Bushman, the Scientology is true. I'm sure you don't think the Jehovah's Witnesses are true. I'm sure you don't think Catholicism is true. I'm sure there are thousands of other churches you would say are not true churches, are not the restored gospel. And you apply a very reasonable, rational uh, standard to all those thousands of false churches. What would it take for you to apply the same standard to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? I'd love to hear it. What would it take? All right, we're almost done. Um, Richard Bushman, if this is God's one and only true church on the face of the earth, as the Doctrine and Covenants itself claims, why is it in free fall in 2021? Why is it hemorrhaging? Why is it losing like 80% of its youth in 2021? Why is it in the United States? Half of all the people raised Mormon have now left the church. Half. Why is the church, uh, why is the church collapsing in Europe, collapsing in Asia, in collapsing in Latin America, collapsing in Canada, in the United States? Why is the church selling off its chapels and stake centers in droves? Why is the church merging wards and stakes and, and closing stakes and missions and wards and branches all throughout the world in 2021? Wasn't this supposed to be the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands to roll down the mountain and consume all nations? Isn't that what we were all taught? Isn't this the noble and great work that was supposed to penetrate every clime and sweep every nation and be spoken on every tongue? Why is the one true church in free fall? And I would add, in spite of your best efforts, in spite of all the paid faculty at BYU that defend the church, in spite of all the legions of apologists at the Maxwell Institute, at FAIR, at FARMS, in spite of all that, in spite of the hundreds of billions of dollars that the church has and has spent, why is the Mormon church, the one true church, the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, led by God's one true prophet with exclusive priesthood authority? Why is that church in free fall in 2021? What does that mean? Even if it's true, what does that say about God? What does it say about Revelation? What does it say about your church? Could you please answer that question? Uh, we would love to know. Next question. To what extent Richard Bushman, and if people get mad at me for asking this question, I think it's a fair question. Anyone who works in the public realm acknowledges their biases. My question to Richard Bushman is, to what extent do social pressures, your status, Richard Bushman, your reputation, your relationships, to what extent do those social pressures keep you blinded um, to the church and bias your ultimate, ultimate conclusions about the church's truthfulness? I think that's a fair question. People hate me for asking it. I think that's a fair question to ask. And that is going to be the question that I end on. So that is the summary of the questions I would ask Richard Bushman. Richard Bushman, uh, I have invited you back on Mormon Stories podcast in the past. You've declined. Um, I extend that offer you to, to you today. I will treat you lovingly and fairly, just like I treated Jim Bennett, who had the courage to come on Mormon Stories, just like I uh, have treated others, believers, who have come on Mormon Stories, just like I treated you, just like I treated Terrell and Fiona Givens. Um, I will treat you kindly. I will treat you respectfully. I invite you to come back on Mormon Stories. And if you won't come on Mormon Stories, Richard Bushman, Will you please answer some or all of these questions in another forum? Whatever research you're doing now on the golden plates or on some Joseph Smith papers project thing or some minutia, none of that is important in my view. And to the tens of thousands, and I would say now hundreds of thousands of people who gave their lives, 10% of their income, whose marriages have been destroyed, to all those tens or hundreds of thousands of people, I would say, these questions I've asked you today are way more important than any other historical pursuit that you're going to pursue for the remainder of your life. So will you just spend a week, a week, a month answering some or all of these questions that I've asked you? Do it on Radio Free Mormon. Do it on Bill Reel's podcast. Do it on Faith, Faith Again podcast. Do it at Maxwell Institute. Do it as a monologue. 
Do it with Peggy Fletcher stack in the Salt Lake Tribune. I don't care where you do it, Richard Bushman. But as far as I know, you're still alive. You still got all your faculties and you still got a lot to contribute. Will you please, will you please show us the hundreds of thousands of people that have been misled and deceived by the church. And by the way, all the scholars that you respect that have been excommunicated, like Fawn Brody, like Michael Quinn, like Grant Palmer, all the scholars that have been punished and marginalized and excommunicated, for them, for us, Richard Bushman, will you please take the time to answer some or all of these questions? It would mean so much to me. Um, and if you don't do it with me, do it somewhere else, but please do it. Final thing I'll just say is uh, these questions that I'm asking Richard Bushman, I want to ask Patrick Mason. I want to ask Spencer Fluman. I want to ask Daniel Peterson. I want to ask um, any credible Mormon historian. I want to ask Matt Groh. I want to ask the editors, Robin Jensen. I want to ask the editors of the Joseph Smith Papers Project. I want to ask Marlon Jensen. You're still alive, Marlon Jensen. You know the answer to many of these questions. Stephen Snow, uh, Richard Turley, you're still alive. You're in retirement. Any, any credible Mormon historian or scholar who's believing, will you please answer these questions that are relevant to you? because hundreds of thousands of us deserve these answers. And most importantly, I'm going to end on this. Russell M. Nelson, Dallin H. Oaks, Dieter Uchtdorf, Jeffrey R. Holland, David Bednar, right? Um, uh, Elder Christofferson, any current member of the LDS Church, the Church of Jesus Christ's First Presidency, any member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, you are prophets, seers, and revelators. At the end of the day, the buck stops with you. At the end of the day, it's not about Richard Bushman. It's not about Terrell Givens. It's not about John DeLynn. It's not about RFM. It's not about Fawn Brody. It's about the prophets, seers, and revelators, the corporation of the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It's about the men who we all raised our right arms to the square and sustained as prophets, seers, and revelators, gave 10% of our income to for life, gave our lives to, gave our reputations to. It is on you to fix this problem. And the Gospel Topics essays don't cut it, okay? And the Joseph Smith Papers Project don't come near to cutting it. And, and Rough Stone Rolling and the book Saints don't come near close to cutting it. Way too many families have been destroyed. Way too many people are suffering. Way too many LGBTQ suicides. Way too many women who didn't live up to their potential. Way too much racism. Way too much ongoing fraud and deception. Way too many people in 2021 who are living in the Mormon bubble and still don't know about any of these things. Right now, the majority of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 2021 don't know anything about anything I've been talking today. Anything about what's in the CES letter, on Mormon Stories podcast, in Rough Stone Rolling, in No Man Knows My History, in the Gospel Topics Essays. Most members have never heard of the Gospel Topics Essays, okay? So, you, First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve, I am calling you out right now. It is on you to fix these problems. Please fix them. Please stop the hemorrhaging. Stop the carnage. Stop the destructions of families. Stop the people being harmed. Please, if you will, I'll give up the podcast and stop. How's that? There's my promise to you. All right, everybody, that is my presentation. These are the questions I would ask Richard Bushman. Um, I want to do a series like this. Well, I've thought about doing a series like this to Terrell and Fiona Givens. I've thought about doing this to um, other people who won't come on Mormon Stories. And I would just love to hear your feedback. If this sucked, I want to hear it. If you loved it, I want to hear it. If you think I could change some things, I want to hear it. At the end of the day, um, I needed to get this off my chest because this was bothering me. This was eating at me. And now I've done it. Um, I'd love your feedback. I appreciate your support. For those of you who um, 
want to see programming like this continue, I just want to say, uh, please contribute to uh, mormonstories.org. The Mormon Church has hundreds of billions of dollars they're throwing at perpetrating continually a false narrative and misleading people, okay? The Open Stories Foundation has a budget, annual budget of about half a million dollars, $500,000. And we're trying to increase our staff, bringing on Kara Burrell, funding Gerardo for our cinematography and graphics, funding Brooklyn Alden, um, funding people to transcribe um, past episodes and put time codes in back episodes. There's so much more we want to do. We need your support if you want to see all this continue. So if you want to continue, um, if you want to see this programming continue, go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button at the top of the page and become a monthly donor. It's 100% tax deductible in the US. We're fully transparent, unlike the Mormon church. Um, and uh, all of your donations will go towards promoting informed consent within the Mormon church and uh, healing and growth for people affected by transition and for people uh, who are leaving Mormon Orthodoxy and or the Mormon church. So please support us if you can. Please spread the word. Please give me feedback if you hated or loved this episode. Please share it wherever you can. And please continue tuning in to Mormon Stories Podcast. Check out Understanding Mormonism, our other YouTube channel, <clears throat> which has shorts. Please check out my new, um, our new TikTok channel, uh, Mormon Stories Podcast TikTok. It's now got close to 40,000 subscribers, thanks to the work of Kara Burrell. Um, check out my Dr. John DeLynn uh, TikTok channel. It's got 11,000 followers now. Um, and just uh, check out all the other good things going on out there. Radio Free Mormon, Marriage on a Tightrope, Bill Real, Mormonism Live, um, uh, you know, Year of Polygamy. Check out Jeremy Runnels' CES letter. Check out Mormon Think. Uh, check out Letter for My Wife. There are so many amazing resources out there. Check them all out. Become educated. Spread the word. Become a missionary for truth. Um, and uh, be good to each other. Be kind to each other. Love each other. And let's find a way to all heal and grow together in the days, weeks, months, and years ahead. Love you guys. Take care. We'll see you guys all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care, everybody.